This week at Starbase, as construction continues everywhere the eye can see, Ship 37 undergoes another round of testing on the Pad A launch mount, SpaceX releases an update on Flight 9 and Ship 36, and gives us a glimpse on the planned activities for Flight 10. Will there be any changes from Flight 9 activities, and what has SpaceX done to improve the chances of success for Flight 10? Let's dig into this week's update and find out. Starting off this week with our production updates, late on Thursday afternoon, multiple engines were moved out of the Raptor's nest on the back of Mega Bay 1 and staged outside Mega Bay 2 before eventually heading inside, presumably for installation on Ship 38. Moving on to the construction at the launch complex, this week we saw additional pieces lifted to the Pad B launch mount and flame trench for installation as crews continue to push the new infrastructure closer and closer to preliminary testing. During the week, a few more fortified vaporizers were delivered to Starbase, eventually making their way into the D1 gate for installation at the tank farm. Across the street from the launch site, a new piling rig was erected at the site of the future air separation plant. Later in the week, rebar cages began to arrive for installation into the holes the rig was drilling, which will eventually be filled with concrete. Up the road at the build site, crews continue to make steady progress on the foundations for the new Gigabay. The tops of the piles are being cut off, then rebar work performed to prepare for the pile cap pours. Meanwhile, additional rebar continues to roll out into the site to keep the crews moving forward. At the Sanchez site, the water tank formerly known as the SN2 test article was being moved out of its previous spot and sent over to the scrap yard. Additional components were being lifted and installed on the new work stand being assembled in the right front corner of Mega Bay 2 as SpaceX builds capacity for a greater production cadence. Moving on to the testing portion of our update, on Friday morning, a purge test was observed from the temporary ship quick disconnect interface on the Pad A launch mount. And just a few hours later, crews could be seen removing the scaffolding from the top of the mount, seemingly indicating that the prep work was done and the mount was once again ready for ship testing. On Sunday, some testing was seen from the methane side of the tank farm, likely to ensure the recent work is ready for the upcoming vehicle testing. Early on Monday, the Block 2 ship lifter was raised in Mega Bay 2 and moved over towards Ship 37. Later, a ship transport stand was brought to the site and eventually parked just inside the building. That afternoon, with Ship 37 now reinstalled onto the transport stand, the Flight 10 Starship was rolled out of Mega Bay 2 onto Highway 4 and down to the launch complex for the second time. In relatively short order, the ship arrived, was taken straight over to Pad A, and parked between the waiting arms of Mechazilla. Within two and a half hours of leaving Mega Bay 2, the vehicle was in position and the arms closed around it in preparation for a lift. A crane was then used to lift the adapter plate up to the ship's ground support connection interface to allow it to attach the temporary ports on the mount. By early evening, preparations were complete, and Ship 37 was once again lifted by the Pad A launch and catch tower and carefully lowered onto the modified ship stand attached to the launch mount. The next morning, as SpaceX prepared for the latest round of testing, the work platform, the man lifts, and a basket of scaffolding were lowered from the mount and moved clear the pad. Shortly after noon, the chopsticks began climbing the tower, moving into launch configuration. Meanwhile, Ship 37 waved as it performed some flap actuation tests. Next, the detonation suppression system was tested, followed by the ship quick disconnect arm moving back in towards the tower. Later that afternoon, the tank farm was spooled up, followed somewhat quickly by venting from the launch mount as SpaceX worked to cool down the Stage Zero infrastructure. Eventually, propellant loads started, but unfortunately didn't last very long before the ship was detanked following an apparent leak in the temporary lines of the ship ground support interface. First thing on Wednesday morning, following an overnight swapping of a flex hose, the farm was spooled back up and the launch mount started to vent once more. Eventually, propellant began flowing into Ship 37 again, followed by another round of flap testing. And just after 8 that morning, Ship 37 performed a multi-engine spin prime test, verifying that the recently replaced Raptor was ready to go without overly stressing the temporary infrastructure with another static fire. The detanking process got underway quickly after the test, and a few hours later the arms were lowered back down and closed in around Ship 37. Around lunchtime, the ship transport stand was moved back over to Pad A. Late that night, the starship was lifted back off the mount and was transferred to the awaiting stand. 
Within a few hours, the ship was rolled out from between the chopsticks and began its journey back to the production site. Upon its arrival, the vehicle was taken back into Mega Bay 2 to receive finishing touches to prepare it for its upcoming launch. With ship testing for Flight 10 now completed, the launch site crawler crane was moved back to Pad A and used to remove the modified ship stand from the launch mount before heading back over to work on Pad B. Not wasting any time, on Thursday and into Friday, crews were busy removing the temporary ship umbilical lines from the launch mount and working to reinstall the 20 booster hold-down clamps onto the arms that were recently vacated by the ship stand. In other Starship news, SpaceX shared pictures of the first grid fin for the next generation of Super Heavy booster. These are about one and a half times larger than the current grid fins and are designed to be stronger. As we've heard before, there will only be three of these per booster, allowing the rockets to descend at a steeper angle while still maintaining control. SpaceX also said that these fins are moving down the booster with the actuator and associated hardware now in the top of the methane tank. A catch point has also been added to the new fins, allowing them to be used for lifting and catching. As the saying goes, the best part is no part, and SpaceX is removing the dedicated lifting points and integrating the function into the grid fins. Following the news on Friday that the FAA had completed its investigation into Flight 9 and that Flight 10 was now approved, SpaceX released a new update on the previous test flight. While the first flight of a reused booster did perform well through most stages of the launch and return, the booster did experience an anomaly shortly after starting its landing burn. This was presumably caused by a failure of the methane downcomer due to the high angle of attack experiment. SpaceX says that they will be using a lower angle from the remaining flights of Block 2 boosters, implying that the Block 3 downcomer will be more robust and not need this concession. While the ship did successfully reach second engine cutoff, apparently beginning about three minutes into the burn, a leak developed between the methane tank and the payload bay in the nose cone. While the systems compensated during the burn, the excess venting from the nose cone led to a significant attitude error, the shutdown of the nose cone vents, and the subsequent aborting of in-space payload testing. Eventually, the ship's automated systems were able to bring the vehicle back under control. Unfortunately, onboard cameras showed liquid methane leaking into the nose cone, leading to the automatic passivation of the ship and the venting of its remaining propellants, resulting in a bad re-entry angle and the loss of the vehicle. Post-flight analysis determined the incident was likely the result of a failure of the main fuel tank pressurization system diffuser. Engineers were able to recreate the issue in testing and have redesigned the part to hopefully prevent future issues. SpaceX also gave us an update on the rapid unscheduled disassembly of Ship 36, tracing its demise to the damage of a composite overwrap pressure vessel, which led to its failure. This caused a chain reaction of damage that resulted in the loss of the vehicle and damage to the surrounding infrastructure. SpaceX has adjusted its testing, qualification, installation, and operating procedures for COPVs moving forward to address this issue. SpaceX has also released their plan for the upcoming Flight 10, which is currently slated to launch next Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. On this flight, Booster 16 will not return to the launch site for a catch, but will instead attempt multiple landing burn tests. This includes the intentional failed start of one of the Center 3 Raptors to observe how the vehicle is able to compensate with an engine from the middle ring of 10. The rocket will then attempt the final phase of the burn on two center engines before entering a full hover above the gulf before splashing down. Much of the ship's flight profile appears the same as previous tests, including the deployment of dummy Starlink satellites and an in-space single-engine burn. SpaceX also plans to stress the tests of the vehicle as much as possible during re-entry to gain as much data as possible as they look towards catching a ship in the future. One thing is certain, excitement is always guaranteed with Starship flights, so make sure to tune in here next week for the launch. Switching over to Florida, on Monday, Falcon 9 Booster 1091 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 on its first mission, carrying 24 Kuiper satellites to orbit for SpaceX's second launch of satellites for Amazon's Internet Constellation. Notably, this booster is the first built as a Falcon Heavy center core to be launched as a Falcon 9, a feat it will likely repeat a few more times following its successful return before eventually being used in a Falcon Heavy configuration. Thursday saw a second launch for the week from that same pad as Booster 1085 launched for the 10th time, carrying another 28 satellites to orbit for the Starlink Group 10-20 mission. On Monday, United Launch Alliance rolled out their next Vulcan rocket ahead of the USS F-106 mission, 
The first national security mission for the rocket successfully launched the next day, carrying both a classified payload for the U.S. Space Force as well as a demonstration navigation satellite for the Air Force Research Laboratory. Tuesday also saw the third launch of an Ariane 6 rocket as it lifted off from the French Guiana carrying a polar orbit meteorological satellite into space. Axiom Space announced that crews are now working to connect the forward and aft sections of the payload, power, and thermal modules ahead of the certification testing before its trip to Houston for systems integration. Relativity released an update on their Terran R rocket, which included the completion of 28 component-level critical design reviews and qualification of their Aeon R engine. This update also detailed the progress on bringing the A2 test stand and Stennis, which is previously used for NASA's Apollo, Constellation, and Shuttle programs back to life. NASA announced that the Orion spacecraft for the Artemis II mission is en route to the launch abort system facility for integration with its abort tower. Rocket Lab has completed its acquisition of GEOST, a U.S.-based satellite sensor maker, adding to the company's growing footprint in the space community. This week, the great Greg Scott once again took to the Florida skies and brought us fresh flyover photos from the Space Coast. Starting off at the park site next to the Vehicle Assembly Building, Bechtel continues to make steady progress on the Mobile Launcher 2 for the Artemis program. In recent weeks, following the ceremonial topping off of the tower, the new umbilical swing arms have been installed that will connect the exploration upper stages of future SLS Block 1B and Block 2 rockets to the ground support infrastructure. Just down the coast at Launch Complex 39A, SpaceX continues to build up the pad Starship infrastructure while still maintaining a steady Falcon 9 launch cadence from the historic site. As crews continue to work on the new flame trench over by the horizontal integration facility, the two halves of the new water-cooled flame bucket have been delivered and are awaiting installation. The buildup of Starship's infrastructure also continues to the southwest at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Foundation work is progressing nicely on the massive foundations for the Cape's Gigabay. Tarps cover recent concrete work, while forms are visible around future pores and the building's eight elevator shafts. On the other side of the site, Starship work is also underway along the facility's normal Falcon 9 operations. Since the last flyover, SpaceX has moved all Starship-related work to one central location in the center of the south side of the site. The first module of the new tower has been assembled on the new tower build foundations with the bases for the new section installed on the pads next to it. Nearby, the corners for two additional tower sections lie on the ground waiting for crews to be ready for them. There are pads for the assembly of nine sections matching what we have seen on previous towers. Given the early stage of the construction for this tower, it's not yet clear if this tower will be the catch tower for 39A or one of the towers for the new pad they'll be building at Space Launch Complex 37. Next to the tower assembly area, work continues in the launch mount construction tent. Outside the tent, we can see three manifold pipes that will be installed around the top perimeter of the mount once work progresses further along. The ship quick disconnect arm that was built years ago was moved into the end of the tent and is seeing new work. The previously installed pipes have been removed, several structural members have also been removed from the hinge end, a new access platform has been installed along the inside of the arm, and the framing for another platform has been removed. Just to the west of the tent, assembly is underway on the chopsticks for the new tower. Many of the main structural elements are laid out to build the arms, while nearby the remaining pieces and the carriage components also wait assembly. Near the south end of the tent, SpaceX has racks of hardware stored, including many butterfly valves with motorized actuators that will be part of the new Stage Zero. Down the road at Blue Origin's production complex, work continues to further develop and expand the site. The facility's north campus, home of the production of Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket, may not be seeing a lot of new construction at the moment, but still had a few interesting items for us to look at. Sitting on a transporter connected to a truck, we happen to catch the aft section for the new Glenn rocket awaiting to be transported to their launch complex. This article, which includes the extendable landing legs, is likely heading out for testing prior to integration at the bottom of the rocket's first stage. Blue Origin has also broken ground on a small expansion to their main factory building. This expansion is expected to increase the production area for fairing halves. Next to the new parking garage, groundwork is underway in anticipation for the beginning of foundation work for the new hardware integration building. 
Over at the facility's south campus, several projects are underway and in various stages of construction. The new lunar plant now appears to be structurally complete and weather tight. Presumably, internal fit-outs are still underway as the company works to get this factory operational and producing Blue Moon landers. The main structural elements for this new spin-form building all look to be in place now. This should mean the external cladding installation will start in the near future to get the building sealed up. Similar to the lunar plant, the chemical processing facility now appears to be completed from the outside, with only internal fit-outs remaining to get it operational. Over near the shuttle landing facility, construction continues on the Project Comet support facility that will allow for a greater processing rate for the Kuiper satellites. Down the coast of Blue Origin's Launch Complex 36, their new Glenn simulator could be seen at the launch pad as the company works to prepare for the second launch of the rocket, still planning to take off before the end of the year. At United Launch Alliance's Space Launch Complex 41, the flyover happened to catch the Vulcan rocket for USSF-106 as it was being moved to the launch pad for preparation for its launch the next day. At Launch Complex 16, Relativity Space continues to progress with the construction of their Cape Launch facilities. Similarly, Stoke Space is also progressing nicely with their own site just down the coast at Launch Complex 14. Also this week, the company released a ground shot of the construction of the pad's umbilical and lighting protection towers. And there you have it, another Starbase and Space Update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.